the Lancasters, a family that would bring forth one of the most powerful and successful English kings, and one of the weakest and most catastrophic. How did they go from dukes to kings, and almost recover the Angevin Empire? After being banished and having his family's lands unjustly seized by Richard II, Henry Bolingbroke had spent time in France under the hospitality of the Duke of Orleans, due to his personal disputes with the French king, and therefore indirectly with Richard II, who had married the French king's daughter. The Duke allowed Henry to lay low and gather his forces for his return to England to restate his claim to the Lancastrian titles of his father. He set sail in early July of 1399 and landed in the Humber Estuary conveniently at a time when Richard II was in Ireland suppressing a revolt. Henry was immediately joined by the vast majority of his Lancaster retainers, who remained loyal to him rather than the king. The earls of both Westmoreland and Northumberland also declared for Bolingbroke. Most surprisingly, the Duke of York, who was the protector of the realm in the king's absence, also joined Henry swelling the ranks of his army even further. Henry marched for the king's strongholds in Wales, as the remainder of the nobles looked on, refusing to oppose his army. It is surprising that so many lords decided to immediately support Henry when he returned to England, though there were three major factors that played into this event. First of all, the king was extremely unpopular due to the tyrannical action he had taken against any who opposed him throughout his reign. Second was the fact that the king had taken the entire royal army and his personal retinue with him to Ireland, meaning that any force that wished to oppose Henry would need to do so without any of the king's troops by their side. And finally was the justness of Henry's claim. It was very unusual at the time for nobles to be disinherited by the king, and was seen by many as an unjust act. With swelling support and seemingly little to oppose him on his march, Henry decided that he would not only seize back his Lancastrian inheritance, but also the throne of England itself. He may have done this due to the threat posed by leaving the king in power after such a large-scale revolt, or perhaps his own personal ambition going to his head. But whatever the case, the nobility that followed him supported his claim to the throne, and continued to follow him. Henry was indeed of royal blood, being descended from Edward III, the same as Richard, Though the normal primogenitor line of succession should have landed the crown in the hands of Edmund Mortimer, though as he was only eight years old, few people disputed Henry's claim. Richard returned, landing in Wales later in July, only to find that he had been abandoned and many of his soldiers began to desert, hearing of the Grand Army of Henry Bolingbroke not far from them. With little hope of opposing Henry in the field, Richard conceded to meet him at Flint Castle, there, he was imprisoned by Henry, and any remaining support for the king dissolved, as he was led to Parliament on the 30th of September. There, Richard was accused of unjust rule and tyranny, and forced to abdicate the throne. The same king, wishing not to observe or protect the just laws and customs of his realm, but to do whatever appealed to his desires, according to the impulse of his will. At times, when laws of his realm had been explained and declared to him by the justices, and others of his council, and when they asked that he should do justice according to those laws, he frequently said, expressly, with a stern and foreboding countenance, that his laws were in his mouth, or sometimes in his breast, that he alone could alter and create the laws of his realm. Powerless and devastated, he was then condemned to the Tower of London, as Bolingbroke was crowned King Henry IV. This overthrow, while putting Henry on the throne of England, also set a dangerous precedent for the decades to follow. Henry had shown that if a king was unjust or weak, it was legally acceptable for his subjects to rise up against him and remove him from power. This precedent would haunt England many years later, though for now at least, there was peace in the realm. Although Richard had been deposed, there were still some who supported his right to rule England, the Earls of Kent, Salisbury, and Huntington rose up in his name in 1400, in what is known as the Epiphany Rising, though sources suggest that they attempted to apprehend the king, even the local people of Windsor attacked and killed many of the rebels. 
showing die-hard support for the new regime over that of Richard's reign. The rebels were quickly destroyed, with Henry even being forewarned of their plot and escaping with his family before anyone could act. Though small, the rebellion still showed Henry that Richard's life was a threat to his throne. At this, he moved Richard to Pontefract Castle in Lancaster, where he conveniently passed away, likely being murdered on Henry's orders, though few questioned the cause of his passing and were ready to adapt to the reign of a new king. The next threat Henry would face to his throne was a major rebellion in Wales, led by the famous Owain Glendore. An Anglo-Welsh noble who started the rebellion in September of 1400, demanding the end of English sovereignty over Wales. Owain raised a small force and attacked the town of Ruthin, though was quickly overwhelmed by the king's forces led by Hugh Burnell. Though they were unable to capture the rebel leader, who escaped into the Welsh heartlands, Henry left his son and Sir Henry Percy in command of Wales, as he was forced to move his main army north to combat incoming threats from Scotland. Owain continued to rouse support in Wales, engaging in guerrilla tactics across the country, continually evading capture from English forces stationed there. With a large strike of luck, he managed to capture the uncle of Edmund Mortimer, who likely under duress proclaimed that his nephew was in fact the rightful king of England in Henry's stead. Owain would continue to utilise guerrilla tactics throughout Wales, raiding towns and English fortifications while avoiding a pitched battle. The situation would get far worse for the king in 1403, when Sir Henry Percy joined the rebellions against him. He was likely convinced into this action by both personal and financial disputes with the king, and also the allegiance of Edmund Mortimer's uncle, who was his brother-in-law. Percy was also joined by his uncle, the Earl of Worcester, and gathered their forces in Cheshire, proclaiming their allegiance to Richard II and his true successor, Edmund Mortimer though their actions against the king would be short-lived. As the king returned from fighting in Scotland to meet the rebels at the Battle of Shrewsbury, the battle would be the first large-scale engagement of longbows against longbows, and would prove to the English, and most notably the young Prince Henry, what a devastating weapon they could be. The fighting was fierce, and it seemed that Percy may win the day, though in a foolhardy charge he was killed, supposedly being struck in the face by an arrow. His death dissolved the rebel forces, many of which now admitted the right of King Henry's rule and would join his cause instead. With internal rebellions crushed, Henry now faced an international threat. English holdings in France had been contested territory since Edward III renewed English claims in France. And in late 1403, when the French renewed hostilities in Aquitaine, marching troops into the area and reconquering town after town, Henry, with little resources to spare, could barely defend against the French advance, being forced to retreat from much of the territory, leaving Gascony as the last remaining bastion in southern France. After a difficult reign characterised by rebellions and war, Henry IV passed away in 1413, leaving his experienced 26-year-old son to be crowned Henry V. Like his father, Henry V would face similar threats in both rebellions and plots against his reign due to his shaky legitimacy, first in the forms of a religious uprising, namely the Lollards, who held disputes against the Catholic Church. Henry was able to quickly suppress the movement and continue solidifying his power at court until he was faced by another threat in the form of another plot to place Edmund Mortimer on the throne. Though, due to the king's growing following, information of the plot reached him before it was executed, and the ringleaders were arrested and imprisoned, removing the threat for good. With ever-growing support, Henry would then launch an invasion of France to recover territories lost since the reign of Edward III. While there, he would engage in the famous Battle of Agincourt, covered in my previous video seen here. After a decisive victory in France, Henry's popularity would grow substantially, allowing him further finance for continuing his military efforts. He once again set out to France in 1417, where he would begin the reconquest in earnest, besieging the capital of Normandy Rouen in 1418. Henry would continue making gains in France, forcing the French into surrendering at the Treaty of Troyes in 1420 
The treaty placed Henry as the heir to France, and Henry would also rule of regent of France until Charles VI's death, making him the de facto king. Though with such drastic success in France, tragedy would strike the English crown. Henry died unexpectedly in 1422, leaving his nine-month-old son with the legacy of a half-conquered throne.